So welcome everybody to our COVID and cancer series. Um, I think most of you know at this point that this is hopefully a very time limited series that is meant um, to provide information and support to cancer patients specifically living during the time of COVID, which is, as we've used the term, a double whammy, you know, a lot going on. Um, and we're really excited to bring um, interesting um, information that's relevant to this specific time period. Um, I'm going to let Marcia introduce herself, but I was fortunate enough to meet her through a mutual friend, and my ears perked up as soon as I heard what she does uh, for um, her job and with her career, and I tracked her down and said, can you please, please um, lead a, a workshop for our patients and survivors? Um, so I'm going to let you introduce yourself, Marcia, and thank you again so much for taking the time to be here with us today. We are absolutely thrilled to have you. And I think I am as eager as our participants to learn from you. So uh, it's, it's my pleasure, Rachel. And thank, thank you for inviting me because I, I, I enjoy this kind of work. And I also find that in a way it's an advantage that we have a small group. I hope that this will be interactive, not just my talking. Um, and with a smaller group of people, you can sometimes talk about um, issues more openly. So if we decide to go in that direction, fine. If we don't, that's fine too. Okay, uh, but essentially, um, I'm very passionate about financial literacy and financial skills training. Uh, this came about because I worked in retail banking for many years. And when I joined the retail bank, it was actually at Citibank, I had no idea what anybody was talking about. I wound up walking around with a pad, listening to people and writing down all the expressions that meant nothing to me. And then sitting down with people later and saying, what, what is this, what is this? And if I don't understand this, how can we expect all of the consumers of our bank to understand this? And we really have to do something about this. Um, I had come out of the cosmetics industry and I was at a point in terms of my own maturity that I understood that if I asked questions and didn't get good answers, it wasn't because I wasn't smart enough to learn. It was because the explanations needed work. So I asked questions after questions after questions. Uh, ultimately, actually five years ago, I decided to open my own business, teaching financial skills to men and women of all ages. Uh, a lot of the work that I do is one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I work with couples, and I'll get to that a little bit later. From time to time, I address audiences like this one. Um, as I explained to Rachel, I am not an investment advisor. Okay. My focus is on getting people to the point where they have the money to invest. Okay. These individuals make up an extremely large group. And this is a group that is largely ignored by the financial service industry. Obviously, because there's not as much opportunity to make a lot of money working with these people. Now, I don't know exactly you know, the sophistication level people I talk to, you know, starts at very low. As sometimes I'm talking to people who know a lot more than I do. So as we're getting to know each other, and I hope there is some interaction, if there's something you don't understand, um, ask. Um, if there's something that you find so basic that you all agree you don't need to know it, I'll just cross it out, okay? Because I want this to be useful to you. Now, one question I have for you before I get started is, uh, what is it that you hope to get out of this hour? Uh, some people like to participate in answering questions like this. Some people would rather step back. So whatever, whatever you want to do is fine. But if any of you do want to address what kind of help you're looking for or what kind of assist, what's kind of help. So, and if not, I'll just, I'll just keep going. I think, um, you know, if I could jump in a little bit also, you know, I think um, your point is really good that people come with very um, varied levels of financial literacy and kind of sophistication. And I know I'm probably on the lower end of sophisticated in terms of knowing that. I think one thing also is even just sort of basic budgeting. How do you, you know, especially when finance is change for mm -hmm. a lot of people um, yes. right now because of the pandemic, I think people are spending less money, but people are also a lot of people are earning right. less money, um, you know, and so how do you kind of manage that when your budget, you know, your income in, and your spending habits are shifting and, you know, what's a Absolutely. good way to stay on top of that? Absolutely. That is going to be the, the key topic for today. Okay. Um, okay. 
Now, I wish I were like Obama. I could just like look at you and talk to you and not look at any notes. But, you know, I, he said that that was a real gift. I don't think I'll ever get there. So if you can bear with me, there are times that I'll be talking just from my heart and times when I will be referring to notes. Okay. Um, I'd like to start off the meeting with a quote from a writer by the name of Neil Gabler. I don't expect that to be a familiar name. Um, he wrote an excellent article called The Shame of the Middle Class that appeared in the Atlantic Monthly several years ago. And this quote really, you know, sometimes you hear a quote, it just makes you stand still and really listen and say, wow, that's, that's really interesting or that's important or that's an interesting way of phrasing things. So I'm gonna read it twice. I think we're finally getting it, that the brain does not work around money naturally. I'm going to repeat that. I think we're finally getting it, that the brain does not work around money naturally. I think you would all pretty much agree with that. It's not a, natu it's not a, a natural thing to mm -hmm. think about, to understand. It, it, it takes work. Um, it's complicated. Uh, we live in a capitalist society. And yet we don't focus on savings or on budgeting. All the information is out there. That's what's really frustrating. All of the information is out there, but we need to do a better job of communicating in a way that people can understand. Um, in my work as a financial skills trainer, part of my job is to take the fear out of clients, to introduce clients to basic financial literacy, and to give them the information and direction they need to take charge of their finances. Now, this is a big problem and it's a big opportunity. Nearly half of Americans are financially fragile, living very close to the financial edge. Now, this was in Neil's article and I found this surprising. I knew things were bad, but I didn't realize they were quite this bad. Close to half of Americans don't have $400 for an emergency. Okay, close to half of Americans, okay. A quarter of households earning between $100,000 and $150,000 a year claim not to be able to raise $2,000 in a month's time to take care of an unexpected expense. Okay. Now, so we're not just talking about, we're talking about, you know, people earning $100,000, $150,000. And sometimes there's no correlation between how much money people have and how they think about it, how they spend it or, or save it. Um, so the subject of today's meeting, as Rachel said, is, you know, fine, is finance in the time of COVID. Uh, the pandemic has obviously heightened our concerns about money and hopefully motivated us to do something about it. So the three main topics for today's meeting are why so many of us are not very good at managing money. And I include myself there. Okay. Money personalities have affect our relationships with money. And if there are problems, there are things we can do about them. But money personalities, which I'm gonna get into in quite a bit of detail are very important to think about. The main topic will be the importance of creating a spending plan, how to do it, how to track it. Now you may notice I call it a spending plan. I don't use the word budget because I think spending plan is more palatable. Like budget sort of sounds like, oh, it's a chore and it's, I don't know, kind of taking something away from you, but a spending plan that puts you in a position where, okay, I have this amount of money and I'm making decisions about how I'm going to spend it. Okay. Um, if there's time at the end, I'll touch briefly on credit cards, the basis of credit cards, if that's something of interest to you. If not, if not, we'll skip that. Okay. Uh, now, why is money so hard to talk about? And I think you all agree. Do you all find that it's, it's kind of hard to talk about it? Have we already lost someone? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, it's intimidating. And it carries a lot of stigma. We're discouraged from bringing it up at a young age. It's impolite to ask people how much money they earn or how much money they've saved. It's hard to learn about it openly. All combined, it makes it easy for us just to ignore money altogether. Now, at this point, I'd like to open up into just a brief discussion of the one thing you were taught or observed about money when you were a child 
and whether that was helpful to you or whether it was not helpful at all, just to get you thinking about money and how you relate to money and your emotional attitudes towards money. Um, I'll start with myself. The first thing I was told is that money is something you don't talk about. It's private. Um, okay. But then I observed something when I was four years old. And in working with my clients, I, I always say this, my work with my clients is about my clients. But when I have something from my own life or my own experience that I think would be useful, uh, I share it. So I will sometimes talk about things that I've experienced that were not very pleasant. When I was four years old, uh, my father lost his business, which to this day is still cloaked in history. And we wound up moving from our house into a small apartment. And I remember, I will never, I will never forget this image of my mother walking around the house and actually like petting the appliance, you know, and saying, she was very brave, tried to be very brave in me. She didn't realize that I was observing this, but clearly this told me that money can cause problems. And I didn't have the words to say, you have to manage it, you have to plan, but clearly it was something something serious and, and it could lead to unhappiness and all kinds of stress. There is so much attached with money. I mean, one of the things I do with when people come to me who are in debt um, and, and generally, you know, these are responsible people who had bad luck and they talk about their shame, their guilt, their embarrassment. And I always say to them, look, I have a requirement. If you're going to work with me, you have to understand that I know that you are not a bad person, that based on the story you laid out for me, you had you did nothing wrong. There are reasons why you wound up in trouble. And whatever shame and guilt is eating at you, just try to just try to put it aside. What we're going to deal with is the problem that's in front of us. That's where we're going to put our energy. Mm -hmm. But there is so much shame. And there's also so much shame about not understanding. I mean, I know situations where people went ahead and made a decision that they didn't have the information at hand that they needed because they were afraid to ask because they thought they were supposed to know something. And I would later say, how could you possibly think you were supposed to know, know that? You've never done X before. So it's really good to have a group that is open. I really, I really appreciate that. And it also, it just makes it more, more interesting and more meaningful for me. So thank you. Okay. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is money personalities. Does that phrase suggest anything to you? Have you heard the concept money personality? Because this is a very, very, this is a very important thing. Okay. Um, like most everything in life, your response is largely dictated by your personality. Okay, so managing money is dictated by your personality, which of course is formed, we could have tons of conversations about this, but we don't need to, but formed at very early ages. Understanding your money personality is the first step to help you shape your approach to finances and how it will affect the bottom line. So there are six personality types. Many people can identify with various aspects they don't fall into just one type, but you can probably find one that's closest to who you are. Okay. Um, and I'm sure as I go through them, you'll start to relate. I already know where Nancy falls in this. Um, there are basically six money personalities. Okay. The first group is big spenders. Okay. These are people who they have nice cars, they have new gadgets, they have brand name clothing. They are typically fashionable and always trying to make a statement. When it comes to keeping up the Joneses, they are the Joneses. They're comfortable spending money. They don't fear debt. And often they do take big risks when investing. Okay. But they're just happy. Money is to spend, to enjoy. And part of money is to spend and enjoy. Okay. Savers. The savers are the opposite. They turn off the lights when they leave a room. They shop only when necessary. They rarely make purchases with credit cards. They don't, they have very little debt and they are sometimes viewed by other people as cheapskates. They're conservative by nature. So those are the savers. Then we have shoppers. Shoppers often develop great emotional satisfaction from spending money. And this was a category I fell into in my twenties and my thirties. 
And it took years of therapy to figure out what that was all about and, and to tend to change it. And it was really hard. They can't resist spending, even if it's to buy items that they don't need. They're usually aware of what they perceive to be almost like an addiction. And they're concerned about the debt it creates. They do look for bargains and they're happy when they find them, but they just keep shopping and shopping and shopping. Debtors. They're not trying to make a statement with their expenditures and they don't shop to entertain or cheer themselves up. They simply don't spend much time thinking about money and therefore they don't keep track of what they spend and where they spend it. Generally, they spend more than they earn and they are deeply in debt. And they're, it's hard for them to sleep nights. And then we have the category of investors. Obviously people who love to invest their money. And many of these people find that it's fun. Personally, I don't. I find investing scary because I'm kind of a chicken. But there are people who really enjoy investing. Okay. Once you determine which of these personalities describes you and your approach to money, you can see that there are things that you can do to improve things. Uh, and they're very, very, basic, but they're hard to do because habits are very difficult to change. Spenders, obviously they could spend less. <laughs> they could save a little more. Uh, one of the things I do with clients who are love to spend is they'll tell me, um, I just saw a dress at such and such a store and I loved it and it was $200 um, and I really don't need it, but I really love it and I really can't afford it. And what do you think I should do? And what I say is, I think you need to ask yourself the question, will buying that dress really enhance your life? Is it really gonna make your life better? Okay. And ask the saleswoman to hold it, which people are usually happy to do and think about it, but really ask yourself the question, Okay, will it enhance my life? Do I really need this? Um, savers use moderation, but savers often miss the fun parts of life. I mean, there are people who, you know, kind of bag lady mentalities who just think they have to save everything and they're going to be fine. I mean, we look at their numbers, we see if they're going to be fine, but it's hard for them to treat themselves to something a little bit extravagant and they miss out on things. And that's, that's a shame because life involves pleasure as well as all of the rest. Um, shoppers, the key thing here is don't spend the money that you don't have. Take control of your credit cards. Credit card interest. Credit cards can cost you a lot of money. Um, first of all, you have interest on a credit card. And then there's the concept of compounded interest, which means that if you only pay the minimum each month, you will pay interest on that and then you'll pay interest interest on the interest. And before you know it, $1,000 charge on a credit card 10 years later, paying only minimum payments, you wind up paying $2,500. So you really have to, you have to, you have to think about that. So, uh, debtors need to set up a plan to start investing. Okay. The bottom line is that while you may not be able to change your money personality, you can address the financial challenges it involves. Self-awareness, knowing where you stand, will allow you to modify your behavior and better achieve your financial life goals. Okay. Now, with this in mind, next step is to create a spending plan. An interesting fact about money personalities, um, I work with couples, and when you have a couple and each of them has a different money personality. Oh boy, that is trouble. And it turns out that one, according to several studies, the main reason couples divorce is because of difficulties, disagreements over finances. The main reason. Okay. And uh, it takes a lot of compromise. It takes a lot of communication to get people together. Um, a couple I've been working with for a couple of years have really been struggling with this. Um, he's a saver. He doesn't need to save more than he has. He's fine. And she loves to spend money. Just she's, she's a shopper. She's a shopper. She's a spender. She's a, she's a, she's a, a lot of these things. Um, he received a, an inheritance for um, $2,000. This is unexpected. $2,000 arrived. And he said to his wife, look at this. I just got a check for $2,000. I wasn't expecting this. And she said, oh, good. We with mad money. We can go play. And he said, no, 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 no. We're going to save it. Okay. And I was there for this discussion. 
And I said, okay. I said, we keep going over and over this. And I said, I said to the husband, do you think your wife's ever going to change in terms of her attitude about spending? He said, never. Same question to the wife, never. And I said, well, what? it's not this was brilliant. This was common sense, but their emotions were so high that it was hard for them to see through it. And I said, well, why don't you compromise? I mean, why don't you, like you, husband, take 50% and save it? And wife, why don't you think of something fun to do? And how do you feel about that? And they said, that's a good idea. But it took years of point where they could put themselves in the other shoes to get an understanding that they did have these money personalities and they were rather fixed. Okay. But each of them gave in a little bit. Okay. So it can cause, it can cause all kinds of arguments. And the key to with this is always is always communication. So I, I sometimes think of myself, it was actually something that one of my clients called me as a financial psychoanalyst, okay? Because sometimes you need to be a little bit, okay? So now, um, let's talk about creating a spending plan. And again, it's not a budget. Let's say it's a spending plan. The advantages are, and by the way, the reason I'm looking at text quite a bit is because I've developed in the years that I've been working in this area, I, I've read so many books and articles about money, and there are a lot that were useful and some that were not. And and there, you know, there are some articles or things from articles that I pulled together that where the authors say things so well that it makes more sense for me to just read them to you. Okay. And I also give them credit. I don't have their names with me. Maybe next time I, I should include that. But let's just talk about the advantages of a spending plan. It lets you know where your money is going. There are so many people I work with who say, I'm earning X amount of year and I don't know where it's going. I mean, I, I, I don't know where it's going. You know, I, I got $200 from ATM yesterday and it's gone and I can't account for it. Okay. So this is, you know, this is an issue for a lot of people. So a spending plan lets you know where your money is going. It helps you decide how to use your money. It makes it easier to save for something special. It shows you where to cut spending if necessary. It lets you measure your progress and it gives you more control. Okay. Now, the way you go about it, and some of this sounds really boring, but some of finance is kind of boring. So you'll just bear with a couple of five minutes of kind of boring, but something that I need to explain. You need to compare income with expenses. If when you finish expenses are greater than income, they're in the red, you're in debt. Okay. If when you finish income is greater than expenses, you're in the black, you're free to spend this extra money on wants or to save it. It will also give the, the opportunity to identify areas where it might be wise to cut back. Now, the first thing you need to do is put together a list of all of your sources of income. Okay. And depending on, you know, depending on where you are in your life, who you are, um, there are lots of different categories. Um, wages, tips, commissions, pensions, annuities, social security, um, subsidies for housing, utilities, childcare, food stamps, tax credits, whole list. And that's pretty comprehensive. And, and by the way, what I can do is if you would like some of this information, well, this will be taped. No, because I was thinking I could also print some things out and send them to you, Rachel, for distribution, if that would be helpful in addition to the that take great. question. Because we can then also keep that as an adjunct to the video. Okay. Uh, the next thing is to put together a list of categories where the dollars go. Okay. Now, in terms of expenses, there are two basic categories. One is fixed expenses. These are expenses that occur regularly and do not change much. So it's things like rent or maintenance or cable TV or car payments, you know, things that you have to pay every month. Okay. That part's easy. The next part is trickier. It's variable expenses. These are less predictable. They include things like groceries, entertainment, the categories change from month to month. And the variable changes are often the best place to make changes in your spending plan. Now, everybody's spending plan looks different. Uh, one client I worked with 
recently. He came up with a list. I show it to you. I think it'll, does this show? Oh, not well. See that there are a lot of categories. Okay. <laughs> a lot of categories. Um, and when you think about it, when you start thinking about where money goes, you know, people sometimes forget about donations or they forget about magazine subscriptions or they forget about, you know, people who stop at Starbucks every morning for a cup of coffee. Um, now, in order to track expenses, you have to do it in a way that's comfortable for you. And it's not just one way for everybody. So much of this has to do with doing it in a way that fits your personality, your style, your interests, your patience level. Some people keep a little book with them and they write down every single thing they spend money on. Okay, coffee, $6, magazine, $5. And they do it for a month. That would drive some people crazy. Some people estimate, okay? Um, that's generally, that's really what most people do initially. They, they estimate. But you have to think in order to put the list of categories, what your life is like. Now, during the pandemic, you know, we're not going to movies. <laughs> we're not going to restaurants unless we're eating outdoors. It's a different time. So the list you put together for yourselves today is going to be different from the list when the pandemic one day hopefully eases and we're back to it a new normal, but think about all the things you spend money on. You know, there are things that people sometimes forget, like, you know, they buy people birthday presents. Um, they wanna go on a vacation, which means that, you know, one month they're gonna wanna have more money than usual. Um, so you just have to think about how you live and what you spend money on, okay? Now, the easiest way to do this so that you have a base is to start with the month that we're in, okay? So we're in April. So if there's some way that you can recreate April and use that as a base, or if you can't, you can use May as a base and you can track your expenses, again, in as much detail as, as compulsive or non-compulsive as you wanna be, track the expenses. And then going forward, and I recommend that you do this on a monthly basis because a month is a big enough chunk and, and in a month bills are due, most bills are due on a monthly basis, some quarterly, but or annually, but most on a monthly basis. And then figure out an estimate and then see what it looks like. And you'll probably be surprised. Uh, there are gonna be some categories where you probably overestimated and some where you underestimated. Now, the first thing you need to know is that you're not broke, that you have, that your expenses are high enough, or that your expenses rather can be taken care of by your income. Okay, but as you look at the various categories, you may be able to identify opportunities to cut back if you want to cut back. Okay, now maybe you don't, but if you want to, and most people do, you know, that's where you get started. So is that clear so far that that's how you go about it? Okay, and what you need to do once you have the base and then you build, let's say you're using May as a base and then you have estimates for June, and then when June is over, you know, track it, not down to the penny, because it'll just make you miserable. And if it makes you miserable to do it, you won't do it. So, you know, in as much detail as you can bear and see where you are. Okay. Now, one of the things that always comes out of this exercise is the difference between wants and needs. Okay. And this goes back to, you know, the client who wanted the, the party dress that she didn't need. Okay. But you do need to go to the doctor. You do need certain certain kinds of insurance. I mean, there are things that are just baked in that you absolutely need. So it's the whole area of things I want that you have to question yourself about. And again, it goes back to, do I really want that? And if I buy that, if I have that, will it enhance my lifestyle? So you have to look at this very, very carefully. And once you've done this, you really do know where your money is going and you do feel that you're in control and it's a really really good feeling you feel safer okay i mean i've had situations where people have said well i'm spending so much money and i don't have enough to support my lifestyle and then we get into conversations about finding extra work okay um i actually have two businesses financial literacy and also career counseling. And they often go together. So we'll often talk about finding additional ways to make money. And there might be, and there's so much out there. I mean, if you go on computer, if you go into Indeed, and there are so many, so many sources for jobs. So it's something to keep, it's something to keep in mind. 
So that, you know, that pretty much covers what the expense, what an expense plan is all about. Um, now I will, I will send you a list that's very detailed. It might, everyone, again, everyone's list is different. I mean, people who work in certain fields are required to go to the hairdresser quite often, okay? Um, there are people who go to the gym because they love it or because of medical reasons they have to, okay? So it's different for everybody. So does this sound to you like something doable? Like something that you could, something doable, okay? And if you get stuck along the way, um, call me or email me, okay? My phone number, if you wanna write it down, and it's a cell, is 212-744-1955, 212-744-1955. And my email address is my last name followed by my first L O N G M A N M A R C I A at gmail.com. And I would love to hear from you because once I start a conversation with people about this, I want to know if it's useful. I want to know how things are going. And that would be helpful, helpful to you. And I sometimes learn a lot from that for myself. Um, now, in closing, just a couple of remarks in closing. Uh, many of you, perhaps all of you, have noticed that I haven't said anything specifically about women, special needs of women. Uh, you know, we, we all know, many of us know, that women tend to live longer than men and ultimately wind up managing vast sums of money. So obviously it's important that women understand money. If it were 10 years ago, I would be addressing specific characteristics of women as they pertain to investing. If this were a group of women in their 60s and 70s, I would address it. What's that? Okay. okay. But what I found in the work that I'm doing with clients is that women are catching up. And another way of putting that is to say, women are just con as confused, but not more confused than men about money. There's it's an equal level of confusion. It's become less, less of a sexist thing. Um, it used to be considered um, not, not feminine for a woman to know about money. Well, that's not true anymore. I mean, that's not, that's not true at all. So not everyone agrees with me. And there are still programs that are dedicated towards women. And, but but I, what I find is that there are also so many men who need the same kind of help. So I don't think, I don't think, and it's not, it's a judgment call. I, I don't think that women need special counseling or assistance. I don't know. Now, do any of you disagree with that? Do you, do you feel that, there's, that that's kind of missing from this presentation? Or are you prepared to accept that we're doing pretty well? I think it's, it's interesting that you say that. I actually was just recently with two friends and we had this exact conversation um, that, that most of my friends are, are married and they said um, that it used to be up until they said about a year ago. So for some reason, I think pandemic has changed things in a lot of people's minds where they were not as involved in the finances. And separately, uh -huh. both of these women said they have been learning about their, their finances and, and how to manage the finances and taking a bit more responsibility. And one of them was saying, my husband keeps asking me my opinion about things. And she's, you right. know, and she was saying it makes her nervous because she's really new to it. But I don't know if that is more of a trend and I don't know why pandemic would have actually impacted this, but it's just interesting that both of these women that I was just with said the exact same thing, that they've been playing a larger role in managing their finances lately. Yeah. So Robin, I see Robin just unmuted from what yeah. you have. Now I am continuing to track programs for women because I want to see, you know, I like to see what they're looking at, but, but again, so far I have not found that much that is specifically geared to women. It's, I mean, it, it's interesting. And, it, and it's also, um, it's heartwarming <laughs> that we are catching up. Okay. Um, a couple of other just closing remarks. Um, and this is really reinforcing some of the things I've already said. Some of it has a slightly new cast. Um, if you don't deal with the emotional side of money management, the practical aspects of money management might not work. So you have to find a way to really look inside and, and deal with these things. Uh, don't be embarrassed to ask questions. Don't ever be embarrassed to ask. If an answer isn't clear, chances are that the problem isn't you. It's rather that the explanation wasn't clear. So keep asking. Never 
there are no bad questions. If you don't, if you need to make a financial decision in an area that you're unfamiliar with, don't act until you have information. And I'll give you an example. Um, are you familiar with uh, the 401k, the savings plan that's provided by some companies, the retirement plan? Okay. If someone has, you see, I mean, even the way things are labeled in banking, 401k, 503b, ugh, um, I wish we had a new vocabulary. <laughs> But I had a situation where a client had a 401k, worked for a company, wanted to take the money out of that 401k's plan and move it to her new company's plan. And she talked to someone in human resources who said, well, we'll just write a check out to you for that amount. It was a large amount of money. She later found out that since the check was written out to her, she has to pay taxes on it. Okay, Barbara, you're nodding. You've run into this? Okay. If the check had been made out to the new company's financial services organization, there wouldn't be any taxes. So she was beating herself up about this. And I said, but how could you be expected to know this? There are a lot of things that, I mean, how can we know it unless we're dealing with it? And it's really, really a shame that the person in human resources who was supposedly an expert on this left this out, but you know, people make mistakes. So anytime you have to make a decision and you, you don't know all the facts, don't do anything until you know all the facts because it's so easy, it's so easy to get into trouble, okay? I mean, if, if people take money out of a retirement account before the age of 59 and a half, they have to pay taxes on it and they pay a penalty. And the penalty is, is about 10%. So again, um, I don't know why it is that, that the banks kind of expect us to know these things. I mean, we, we don't, we're not taught these things. And, and the other thing that I found and many of, of us have found in the world of financial education is that it doesn't really have a lot of meaning to someone until it's useful. Okay, so you can learn these things in a class in high school, financial literacy, what these things mean. But it's, it's like, do you really remember the periodic table of elements unless you go into chemistry? You forget it. I mean, it doesn't really have meaning until it has meaning for you. Okay, so you have to be careful. The last thing is, is that being capable, being competent with money um, is a long-term journey. It takes patience. Don't expect to learn it all at one time go slowly, be gentle with yourselves, you know, and, and you, and you will get there. Okay. So that's basically the end of this. Um, what I, what I do in working with my clients is I try to demystify money. I try to make them feel comfortable around it so that we can talk about it openly and freely. And it's that kind of communication that brings people forward. And again, I really appreciate the fact that this group is open because there are some groups where you know, people do not want to participate. And I understand that, but we're just, it's just very lucky that you're involved and um, that's, that's really good. So do you have questions for me? Okay. Anything at all? Everyone to unmute if you, if you like. I'm wondering if you could tell us what are some of the most common, if you could, use this word mistakes, you know, that people make when trying to um, manage their finances? Um, acting before they learn. Yeah, you know, like this example of the 401k. Um, if we've got into a discussion about saving money, CDs versus money market accounts, uh, you need to understand the advantages and disadvantages to both. I mean, for example, um, with the CD, you have a three month CD and you take the money out before the three months is over, you know, there's a penalty for that. So it's, it's really a question of, um, it's a question of learning and asking questions and becoming comfortable with it. And, uh, you know, talking to people, I mean, in, in the work that I do, I mean, I have some friends who know so much about finance and, you know, I ask them questions all the time. And of course I have to say, you have to interpret that. We need a translator, you know, I'm not quite sure what you just said, but, but where, where it really starts is where we are, all of us today, is that there's an interest, 
there is an acknowledgement that most of us can do better and there is a motivation. Okay, and of course, when it comes to investing, which I'm not an expert in, the key thing is if it looks too good to be true, it is too good to be true. You know, the whole Madoff scheme, I mean, it looked too good to be true. So you really have to, and, and seek out people you trust. Um, it could be a family member. It could be someone who works in a bank. Uh, when you get to investing, some people do it on their own. We're not gonna, we're, I'm not here to talk about that, but in general, um, I recommend that people go to financial advisors. You know, we go to doctors, we go to lawyers. You know, we don't have to know all of it. We have to find someone we trust. And you find out about these people through your friends. I, I dealt with some people who were getting a mortgage and I sat in on the conversation with the banker um, and nothing was said about hidden fees. And at the very end, I said, um, I said, well, you know, what about other fees that we're not talking about? And this was a young couple. It was the first time they'd taken out a mortgage and they were shocked. Now it didn't turn out to be a huge amount in terms of a percentage of their mortgage, but nonetheless, you know, you have to ask. I, mean, I, I have a client who, who sometimes asks the question when he deals with his banker, uh, is there something I didn't ask you that I should have asked you? You know, and that's, that's a good question. Is there something I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? And it you know, gets people thinking. Interestingly, that's something that we recommend for our patients to ask their doctors. <laughs> so absolutely, you know, yes. we encourage that exact question that we yeah. say, you know, for people that are newly diagnosed. Uh -huh. And do you have any specific advice, Marsha, before we wrap up? Um, again, all of our attendees and people who will be watching are cancer patients. Do you have any specific advice for people who have a medical illness or a medical history? Does the advice, is it still the same? Is there anything um, particular or specific to that population that you would recommend? No, not really. I mean, the, the advice is, the advice is still the same, you know, and of course I, I hope that, that uh, the whole issue of, um, I mean, I've run into people who didn't have supplemental insurance. You know, they had Medicare, but they didn't have supplemental and they bought 20%. Like, you know, I don't need that. Um, so, I, you know, I hope that, that those of you who are going through this do have that. Um, I, I did find, because I worked with people who were patients at Mount Sinai and also Memorial Sloan Kettering. It, the, and this may be totally irrelevant to this conversation, but, but I, I did encourage them to talk to the finance people mm -hmm. in those hospitals. And they were very, very accommodating. Okay, so if you find yourself stuck with some kind of a bill that, that doesn't fit into your plan, doesn't make sense, you know, ask, ask for help. There's never anything wrong with asking, asking for help. Um, and I would I guess do a little plug. I think that's fantastic advice. And as a social worker, I would do the plug also yeah. that if you're having an issue with your hospital bills, to speak yeah. to the social worker, because again, yeah. um, that person can advocate for you. There are also some programs yeah. that can provide grants for medical co-pays. Uh -huh. um, the woman uh -huh. does have a, a financial assistance program. So I think that's yeah. fantastic advice. Thank yeah. you so much. And again, like don't ever feel embarrassed. I mean, Absolutely. if you need help. I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I see homeless people, people have different ideas about this, but you know, I see homeless people on the street and, you know, some of them, there's something about them that calls out to me, you know, when I approach them and, and I introduce myself, you know, I'm Marsha, what is your name? And, and I get their stories and I say to them, this could happen to anyone because so many of their, I'm not talking about people who are dangerous or whatever, but, you know, people who just fell on really, really hard times. And it's just so clear, it could happen to anyone. I mean, life can pay, as you know, I mean, in terms of health, life can play terrible tricks on us. Um, the only other thing I would caution, and I caution people who are going through some kind of heartache in a relationship or illness or whatever it is, that sometimes that's not a good time to make a big financial decision. Sometimes it's just better to wait until you can really focus on it until you're calmer until you're, you know, you're clearer about where you're heading. But I think that's kind of obvious. And yet I know people who have been very ill who said, well, I've always wanted a whatever, McMansion in New Canaan. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna buy it now, okay? And that was right for that person. But generally speaking, you know, I would say it probably makes sense to give yourself time. 
I'm going to tell you something from my own, from my own personal experience. Uh, yes. My husband, my husband died of pancreatic cancer eight years ago. And um, along with his illness, there were a number of accompanying financial challenges and problems. Right. And we fell into that donut hole. Um, and it was, it was a big amount. And it was, a, it was a tough amount. And I did go to the financial office. And the other thing I did is I did discuss it with this oncologist. This is at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And her name is Eileen O'Reilly. And she was so magnificent. And I laid out what had happened. And I felt, and I did feel, I felt, I, I did feel embarrassed, you know, going to her and talking about this. Um, but she put me at ease and she said, you know, this isn't a new story. Okay. But she also told me that if I had difficulty with the financial office, she would vouch for me. So I went to the financial office. I don't know if she ever got involved. I don't, I don't think she did, but you know, I presented with them with some paperwork and we were, we were basically told, don't worry about it. It's, you don't have to pay this money. Yeah. I'm also, I'm also a big believer in going to where our senators, you know, they represent us. I mean, Carolyn Maloney is someone I sometimes go to if I see a problem in the neighborhood or something. Yes. But, you know, there are, I mean, I do find that there are people out there who, who will help. It yes. takes a lot of energy, a lot of focus, but yeah. so don't and, give and up. And again, the social worker can help be a liaison for that. So right. I would specifically talk to whoever your social worker is. Okay. Um, so yeah. so we, are, we are almost out of so time. Crucial. I know the social workers, exactly. I mean, again, as a social worker myself, this is something that was not uncommon, you know, and, and again, there is paperwork and a lot of the drug companies do have uh, programs for people at different income levels and with different types of insurance. So uh -huh. uh, before you think you need to actually pay that out of pocket, I would try to exhaust all resources. Absolutely. So we are almost out of time. Um, okay. You know, Marsha has made her um, information readily available to everyone for any follow-up questions. But Marsha, I just wanna thank you so much for today. I think this was a really, really important discussion. And as you started out uh, by saying, it's something that a lot of people don't talk about that feels, you know, taboo. It comes with a lot of um, baggage for many people, you know, the issue of finances and personal finances, and especially for cancer patients, when there are a lot of unexpected expenses and financial situations shift around. So I think it was extremely, extremely helpful. Quite a few people were uh, messaging me during this saying that this is really great. They want your information. So um, I, it clearly um, resonated, you know, with our, Good. I'm very glad. With our women. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your personal story and your expertise with us. Um, I love that this was accessible to everyone of all income levels and the information was really relevant and appropriate no matter what everyone's situation is. Um, I also Good. want to thank everyone for taking the time to join today. I want to thank you all also for sharing because this is a very personal topic, as you said, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, for sharing your stories and your, your experiences. So thank you so much, Marcia. This was Welcome. really- Good, and it was a pleasure meeting all of you and best of luck.